Okay, so where the hell are you so close to me? All right, so we started off with the isometrics here. Isometrics are the ultimate, you know, the ultimate way to eradicate sticking points. And what I mean by this is they sort of fell out of favor for a long time. So a brief history on isometrics is they were one time touted as sort of like the, you know, the almighty way to gain strength in the 1950s. Bob Hoffman and Dr. John Ziegler made millions of dollars on their isometric system. And they had like mainstream athletes like the uh, hammer thrower from the Olympics, like Jay Sylvester. I think it was Bannister, one of those guys that was the first one to to run the you know the four minute mile and all these pe different people using isometrics. Well anyways, to make a long story short is uh, York Barbell said they, they had numerous people setting world records, starting off with Bill March and it just killing the Olympic lifting records. And they claimed it was because of their isometric system. But what wasn't fully disclosed by Bob Hoffman is he gave John Ziegler um, access to the York Barbell team and he started experimenting Diana Ball, D-Ball, on these athletes. So that obviously played more of a role probably in the world records than, than the actual isometrics. So once the cat was let out of the bag, everybody raised hell and said isometrics sucked because they, they thought the gains were only because of the um, D-Ball and had nothing to do with isometrics. But I've seen plenty of people train like total morons and poodle dicks at like LA Fitness and places like that and they, they're on drugs and they're still weaker, they're physically flaccid than people that train correctly not on drugs. So obviously drugs, Diana Ball, all that stuff helps a lot, but so do the isometrics to help some too because you can't just train like a total moron and set these world records. So we need to look at the value of isometrics. What we want to do is you want to set up the isometrics at the level where your sticking point is. So this could be applied to the, the best luck I've ever done some stuff with bench press on this is bench press, deadlifts, and overhead presses, but this could theoretically work on anything. So you wanna set this up at where you're having the issues. You know, so if the sticking point, so Kyle was about, you know, right, you know, wherever, where he was right there. So he's gonna pull as hard as he can against the pins for six seconds, okay? Then wait a couple minutes, and then he's gonna follow that up with a with a deadlift, a regular deadlift. So we do these typically. If you're doing this part of like a training protocol, you do like your, maybe your heaviest set. Then we do your compensatory acceleration sets after your heaviest set. You go an isometric at your sticking point. Rest two to three minutes, or whatever you're gonna rest. You can rest for like five minutes. Do a speed set for you know a single or double. Rest again. Go back to the isometric, back and forth. So a good place to start is three three sets at your sticking point because you can produce about 15% more force for about 15% longer with these isometrics. So they're, they're a great way to eradicate sticking points. Again, the best luck we've had so far on them is, is overhead press, bench press, and deadlift. And what they also do is they, they're sort of a conditioning contraction. So after you do that, subsequently, when you go back to the regular lift, you're, it's scientifically proven you can produce more force. And you don't, you know, instead of cornering lab coats and you know seeing for yourself just try it and i guarantee you're going to lift more this way it's a great way to get rid of sticking points so that's what kyle's doing right there isometric regular deadlift so snatch grip deadlift that is this is one of the best upper back developers there is and if you notice we're not starting at the floor level because this snap we're elevating to about mid shin so the range of motion would actually be similar to conventional deadlift, and a lot of people have gotten great range, like great results, like Charles Poliquin, actually doing these on, on, not only on the floor but from a deficit. But I think a very good starting point to make sure you can keep a flat back is at that mid shin level. If that, if you're able to accomplish that, then you slowly and gradually lower the weight. You know, the reason, so why this is important is, it, is so Olympic lifters go, they go with a very wide grip. If you see people doing snatch, if you see Olympic lifters snatching, they're like collar to collar. We don't need to go that far for like bodybuilding or strength purposes, because we're just trying to get, a, we're trying to get a better, you know, workout, not a competitive number. It's worth like a risk and injury. So the, um, the upper, by the wider, what the wider grip does, is that's gonna put more, way more stress on your upper back, your traps, and your rear delts. Um, and obviously the wider you grip, the harder this is going to be. 
and um, you want to make sure I mean ideally um, we um, you, you could do this on deadlift blocks we had um, someone was using the deadlift blocks so we did in a rack which is fine because Kyle's not out call it a collar but obviously if you're doing these in a rack you don't want to um, smash your hands that would not be good so you also want to wear straps it's gonna it's gonna feel very awkward if you go over under grip and um, there's no point of doing it. it's a lot harder to, even if you have great grip strength it's gonna feel a lot harder out wide so we're not after this to you know work your grip we're after it for the movement so so just go ahead and do that and you want to make sure that you start light next on to the good old 2-1 eccentric rows this is one of my favorite upper back builders i actually learned this one um, from christian thibodeau so what you're gonna do is you're gonna pull the weight like a cedar row you're gonna pull with both hands pull it fairly explosively you're gonna let the weight back with one hand you want to do it and when you do that you want to do a five second negative so we're going to set up three here on each side okay so a good starting point is to do 70 percent of what you normally do for like say a set of five or six so if you go 100 if you go 200 pounds 70 percent of that's 140 so that'd be a good starting point. you do 100 pounds you go 70 pounds okay so what the eccentrics what they there's so much stuff they do that you know preferential fast twitch muscle fiber recruitment they um I mean, they do, they do, I mean, we can get into um, all sorts of things that they do, even like um, like satellite cell proliferation and all sorts of fun stuff. You can, um, you know, look up on Google Scholar if you want. But the bottom line is they build muscle. And they're also going to help, you know, they're also going to be prolong your time under tension. So it's a great way to do it. I've done this with a lot of athletes. The, the body adapts pretty quickly to eccentric, so you want to do this for a shorter, you don't want to do these for, you know, more than a few weeks in a row before switching them out. Next on to... Mechanical advantage drop set pull-ups. So all that all we're doing here is you start um, We had Daniel fill in here. Um, I think uh, I don't know what Kyle. I think Kyle was uh, meditating or something. So we had Daniel fill in and uh, What he did is he started the weakest grip he had which is a wide grip pull-up He did um, as many reps as he could right there rest 10 seconds Next was on to a chin-up. That's his, that's the second strongest grip So he did as many as he could there then finally you know, when he's totally fatigued, he goes on, you know, rest 10 seconds, goes on to the neutral crit pull up and reps it out there. Very good stuff. Okay, that's called a mechanical advantage drop set. You can do that pull up. I mean, you think about it, we've talked about it before with inclines where you drop it down. I mean, you could do it with squats, you can do all sorts of things, leg presses, whatever, whatever you want. Um, the world's your oyster, have at it. Okay, finally, um, we uh, finished off with um, some reverse. Uh, bench pull downs just right there in the bench so if you're doing this for powerlifting purposes just just get just set up how you normally bench press pull the bar down in reverse motion you get great upper back activation this way and it's gonna you know it's a it's it's a very obviously a lot of these rowing movements um can be you know so a lot of times like bent over rows and stuff you know actually would pair them if you're doing like an upper lower split on a lower body day because they're they're so dang stressful on your back so that's what a lot of people you know We've talked before about the lab coats, you know, over at the NSCA and places like that. They'll put out some workout in the upper body day, you know, today you, you do bent over rows. Well, if you're really hoisting some pig iron up, those put a hell of a lot of stress on your lower back, more so than deadlifts a lot of times. So if you do that and then you're trying to squat and deadlift the next day, I mean, you're going to keep the chiropractor in business and, and maybe worse. So um, this is a good way to, to do an upper back movement because we're always talking about when I make these videos and articles about, you know, so-and-so set world records, the key variable, if you, you know, a lot of times you don't look what everybody's, what it's always disagreeing. The one thing that seems to be constant in all these ones, I do and other people do, is lots of upper back training. And the way you make that effective is by not totally fatiguing your lower back. Okay, so that's what we're at. And this is a great movement to add to your arsenal. Have a nice day.